Association of Educational Researchers and Evaluators of Nigeria, ASERIN, is inviting you to the 22nd Annual Conference, Umo Decade 2020, on the theme Educational Research and Evaluation in the 21st Century, date 20th to 24th July 2020, venue Michael Opara University of Agriculture, Umo Decade, Nigeria. This conference is geared towards improving the quality of education and evaluators within and outside Nigeria to share innovative ideas on the theme. All abstracts should be submitted to akanwa.esla.mouau.edu.ng or odo.collins at mouau.edu.ng before 31st March 2020. And to register, please visit the ASERIN website on www naere.org.ng or kindly call Michael Akinshola Mitibemu on plus 234-7058-539888 for more information. L'Association des chercheurs et évaluateurs en éducation du Nigeria, ACERN, vous invite à la 22e conférence annuelle nommée Oumudike 2020 sur le thème recherche et évaluation en éducation au 21e siècle. Date 20 au 24 juillet 2020, lieu Université d'agriculture Michel Okbara, Oumudike, Nigeria. Cette conférence vise à améliorer la qualité de l'éducation et à promouvoir le développement national et offrira aux éducateurs, chercheurs et évaluateurs au Nigeria et à l'extérieur des opportunités de partager des idées innovantes sur le thème. Tous les résumés doivent être soumis à akanwa.ursula.edu.ng ou odo.collins.mou and universities on Twitter and AAU TV official on Instagram. You can also visit our dedicated website at tv.aau.org for more of events updates. I am Isabella Tita Hinakwa. Je m'appelle Alexandra Mpaba Johnson. The Association of African Universities, AAU, is an international non-governmental organization set up by universities in Africa to promote cooperation among themselves and the international academic community. Uh, mon nom est déjà en 1960. Nos dirigeants estimaient que l'éducation est l'outil majeur pour pouvoir lutter contre la pauvreté et assurer le développement. Universities benefit from being members of the association is this big platform that allows them to collaborate, allows them to work together, allows them to teach together. Through this platform, a university in North Africa can work with the university in Southern Africa and also those in East Africa can work with those in West Africa. Founded November 1967 at a conference in Rabat, Morocco by heads of African higher education institutions, the association is currently headquartered in Accra, Ghana. My name is Maxwell Amohoit. I'm the Director of Finance of the Association of African Universities. The association sustains itself from contributions from member universities and also from other development partners. Some of our division of the Association of African Universities. The Association of African Universities hosts the Secretariat for the uh, African Union's Continental Education Strategy. And by so doing, we provide coordinating roles for the African Union in helping members achieve their targets. Déjà en 1960, nos dirigeants estimaient que l'éducation est l'outil majeur pour pouvoir lutter contre la pauvreté et assurer le développement. Et rappelons-nous que les années 60, la décade 60, a été une décade où on, euh, disons, pris les dispositions pour être indépendant. My name is Jonathan Umba. I'm the Director of Research and Academic Planning. 
The programs and projects that we run at AAU are consistent with our strategic plan and they are implemented for our higher education stakeholders, namely the higher uh, education in Africa, implemented in such a way that our stakeholders will get the benefit of membership of our association. And our programs also are aligned with uh, a number of uh, the Continental Education Strategy for Africa. That uh, are affiliated with the AAU uh, in the region. But as you well, universities that are not members of the AU are missing quite a lot. First of all, let's appreciate this one point, that uh, the AAU is a main driver from the angle of training and capacitating the human resources of the continent, the agenda of the African Union 2063. So if a, an institution is not on board, it is missing the opportunity to leverage on uh, the uh, opportunities that are provided by the association in the area of uh, training uh, human resource capital, training their own staff. There was a reunion in Khartoum. universities in in Africa especially in East Africa those which are not members still in the Association of uh, African Universities uh, be, we are calling them because we feel the organization is ours it COVID-19 pandemic has necessitated the need for higher education institutions to establish their impact through applied research. It is in this regard that the Africa Centers of Excellence for Impact within the sub-region. The 53 centers across the continent are putting in place measures to manage the pandemic in their respective countries. In Nigeria, the Africa Center of Excellence for Genomics of Infectious Diseases, ASGID, at Redeemers University, in coordination with the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, was the first institution in Africa to successfully sequence genomes of SARS-CoV-2, which is the COVID-19 virus. This will strengthen surveillance for tracking mutations of the virus. The center has also developed a COVID-19 screening tool to measure individual risk level. Also, AgeJet seeks to use advanced genomics science to accelerate the production of a homemade vaccine against the virus. The West African Center for Cell Biology of Infectious Pathogens, WACBIP, a cell biology research center dedicated to the diagnostics of tropical diseases in sub-Saharan Africa at the University of Ghana has also successfully sequenced genomes of SARS-CoV-2. This is a milestone in Ghana's response to the pandemic, as it well aid in the tracing of the sources of community infections in people with no known contact with confirmed cases. Examined how the COVID-19 is spreading in time and into new areas, its impact on urban mobility and learning in their respective institutions. The Africa Centers of Excellence at Center of Excellence Project is a flagship program where the World Bank, in partnership with the French Development Agency, Education and Applied Research. And as we know, smartphone connectivity has already now have in the continent 
And uh, what do you think? Where are the bottlenecks and, and where are the, the opportunities for the future? So everybody very much welcome and much, uh, Lisa. And um, as part of our project, um, I have authored uh, a policy note that actually was published this week. It hasn't been launched yet, but I'm um, sharing it here as a soft launch with you. It's called Resources, Relevance, and Email of kind of a, a larger, I will share the link to it um, in an email after we uh, meet today. I think it shares kind of a, um, an idea of a larger context, just like Lisa was, was talking about. Universities are, are interconnected in the whole world, but um, to uh, the African continent. And I was part of a webinar the other day uh, organized by the International Association of Universities, the IAU, uh, and there's a professor there from Ethiopia, uh, Professor Tamrat, and he was talking about the previous normal and the new normal. So I, I borrowed a little bit from him and I added a few points. But I think just before we launch into the discussion, it's kind of important to contextualize um, a little bit. Uh, the previous normal for, for the continent uh, was growing economies for most uh, countries, some with the highest growth in the world. Uh, we could see kind of a predicted growth. Uh, we had uh, development, but of course access uh, is highly unequal. Even when universities admit more students, uh, the share of poor students is still relatively small um, from poor households. And it's more the, the elites that have access to higher education. Uh, digitalization was budding, but also had huge barriers, such as low bandwidth, high costs, and of course, power irregularities. Um, our societies were interconnected, uh, but there was also huge dependency on foreign solutions. Uh, now we're into a new normal. Economies all over the world are contracting, but there's huge uncertainty. We don't know when this crisis is ending. Um, we don't know exactly how it will um, be was suggesting. Um, we're focusing on access and digitalization. And I think with that, as planned, we're launching into um, the presentations a little bit early. Uh, Desire, can I call on you? Are you ready to share with, you, with us your presentation? COVID-19 lockdown, can South African universities guarantee quality e-learning for students with disabilities? The floor is yours. If you want to unmute yourself. Glad to be our timekeeper so that you wrap up. Okay, thank you. Thank you too. And, and those of you who feel more comfortable turning off your camera, you can, you can do so. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Desire Chiwandire. I just finished uh, my PhD at Rhodes University focusing on the inclusion of students with. So the title for my presentation is uh, Lock, uh, COVID-19 Lockdown. Can South African universities guarantee quality e-learning for students with disabilities? So basically, I was mainly interested on the issue of uh, how, you know, touch size or regular students, including students with disabilities. So I won't provide much historical background uh, on that. You know, South Africa is one of the universities which has also resorted to e-learning, you know, and this is a new phenomenon, especially in South Africa and most African universities to having to focus, uh, to adopt. So if you look in the South African context, you know, when it comes to the inclusion of students with disabilities, this is a group of students who have mainly been excluded when it comes to educational opportunities. Why? Because more emphasis has mainly been uh, uh, for this curriculum from the perspective of uh, non-disabled students. So I think it's important for me to begin by defining uh, the concept of, inclusion, uh, of inclusive education. So the dominant uh, definition of inclusive education is supporting uh, learners with disabilities so that they are able to be involved with their non-disabled peers 
to the maximum extent possible. So mainly this is a concept which emphasizes uh, the need for students with disabilities to be supported, you know, on the same level with their non-disabled peers, mainly in what is often referred to as the regular classroom setting. You know. So very often it involves adapting the curriculum in, in order to ensure that, you know, students with disabilities are equally supported. So when we talk about inclusive education, mainly, you know, there is what I refer to as five pillars of inclusive education, you know. So if an educational institution can meet these uh, five, uh, five criteria, then it shows that, you know, that particular educational institution, you know, could be considered as a best practices in terms of supporting students with disabilities. So very often funding is one of the most important uh, aspect of inclusive education. And in South Africa, we've got uh, what is often referred to as national bursaries, which provides uh, funding for students with disabilities to access higher education. Uh, mechanism is the provision of reasonable accommodations, which varies depending on the student's uh, disability. Uh, you know, for let's say for students with specific learning disabilities, this could come in the form of extra time. And the other aspect is uh, accessible built environment. You know, there is a need for universities to to build uh, the buildings in line with the universal design principles, so that they can be accessible, particularly for students with physical disabilities or mobility challenges including those uh, with other disabilities. You know, this could be students with visual impairments. And there's also the provision of, us, uh, of assistive devices. This mainly applies to students uh, with visual impairments. And there's also the need to ensure that the curriculum is accessible to students with diverse disabilities. And this involves the role of lecturers. So for purposes of this presentation, I was mainly interested on the impact of uh, COVID learning you know, through the lens of uh, students with disabilities and support staff members. So I designed uh, a questionnaire like, which had like uh, five questions, you know, which I forwarded to students with disabilities at one institution. And uh, I also forwarded it to support staff members. So in the questionnaire, what I was mainly interested in was to explore, you know, which academic year the student is and the faculty, you know, their disability and how the lockdown is affecting or has affected their learning. How their university is supporting them, you know, this could include lecturers, you know, tutors or that they are currently experiencing. So the questionnaire for disability unit staff members, you know, in Africa, they, of, they are often referred to as disability unit staff members. But in other, in other settings, you know, they are referred to as uh, disability coordinators. But yeah. So I was mainly interested on the measures that their unit are actually taking to support students uh, with disabilities. And... Uh, I wanted to hear from their opinions that which uh, category of students uh, disabilities with disabilities are more likely to be affected by remote learning and why. I was also interested on the support, you know, that the, uh, the lecturers and tutors are providing during the lockdown, you know, if they are doing any form of collaboration. And also I was interested in potential challenges and opportunities you know, that could be uh, that emanate from the, from the lockdown. So from the findings, you know, the findings, you know, so basically five students responded and most of these students, most of all of them had invisible disabilities, which ranged from depression, anxiety, epilepsy, you know, and I used snowball sampling, you know, so I contacted one student that I know with an invisible disability who then referred me to her, uh, to her friends who also contributed to the study. So what I found, the dominant finding amongst students with disabilities, they felt that uh, the university tends to use a one-size-fits-all approach, you know, when it comes to the inclusion of students with disabilities. 
And this was more of like two-sided that, you know, university seems to focus mainly on non-disabled students at the cost of, of disabled students. Even within students with disabilities themselves, they felt that, you know, students with disabilities are treated as a homogenous group, you know. So with more attention pay, being paid on students with visible disabilities at the cost of students with invisible disabilities. So this is a dominant uh, finding. Even. Three minutes remaining. So the other challenge is, is that, you know, there was a, the dominant understanding was that you know, for some students, you know, there was a emphasis, especially from disability unit staff members that, you know, blind students and those with specific learning disabilities uh, more will be disproportionately affected in comparison to their peers. Especially because for blind students, most of them, they rely on assistive devices, you know, they have access in disability units. But now that they are learning from uh, home remotely, you know, they don't have access to those assistive devices. The same also applies to students with specific learning disabilities who rely on scribes. Because they are working from home, they will be disadvantaged from that particular access. And also there is an issue of socioeconomic, uh, one socioeconomic background. You know, in South Africa, universities are divided in historically black institutions and historically white institutions. So participants from historically black institutions raised concerns about, you know, how most of the students live in remote connectivity. Other participants, uh, disability unit staff members, spoke about uh, how first-year students with disabilities are more likely to be affected because, you know, this group is in its early phase because this was the first semester. So this group is in its uh, early phase of trans transitioning to university. So most of them are still learning about how to use assistive devices and all that. So they felt that, you know, when it comes to some students, they felt that, you know, when it comes to opportunities, there will be flexibility, you know, because most universities are quite flex flexible on lecturers uh, are not supposed to impose strict deadlines as they will do if it's conduct sessions. So they felt that, you know, that's an opportunity that could be created uh, by learning from uh, remotely. And some participants uh, felt that the delivery of hard copy material could help them, you know, especially this participant uh, has epilepsy and she was speaking about how she can't stay on the computer for a long time. Other participants felt that, you know, students with uh, physical disabilities are less likely to be affected by learning remotely. You know, especially if they, if they are learning in universities where there is, uh, which uh, the built environment is inaccessible. Uh, when it comes to some felt that, you know, this will create an opportunity for lecturers to move away from their comfort zone, you know, especially because most lecturers in African universities, including South Africa, they have mainly been used uh, to teaching students through contact sessions. So this could encourage them to learn about how to use technology in order to support students from an e-learning standpoint. So in terms of conclusions and recommendations, there was emphasis that, you know, students, uh, lecturers need to learn uh, about universal design for learning, you know, so that they can be able to create and deliver the curriculum that could be accessible to students with diverse disabilities. Online. And lastly, there was emphasis on connectivity to say, even though the universities are providing laptops, you know, to, to students with disabilities, it's important to emphasize the issue of connectivity because without connectivity, some students will be excluded. You know, so online learning could provide uh, equitable opportunities, provided there is uh, adequate opportunity to ensure that connectivity is enhanced. So that's all from my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Desire, for your uh, presentation.
Um, if there are anyone who has questions, you can write your name in the chat. Um, I had a question kind of relating to your last point about connectivity for the, their um, connectivity situation. Did they have um, a fixed line at home or did they get any help from the university or they used their phones? What was the right, uh, institution? So most of them seem to have their own laptops and the institution is providing them with data. So most of them don't necessarily seem to have any challenges with connectivity. The only issue that they had was the issue of not having uh, more opportunities to interact with their supervisors. And also remember, these are uh, on their postgraduate studies. Some of them are because in these institutions, you find out that some students don't even have a laptop. Yeah. And they're okay. still waiting. The online work, working from home without a laptop, that is um, a challenge. Thank you so much, Desire. I think if there are more questions, we have to push them to the discussion later on. And now we are moving on to Professor Stian Hoagbei, and he will talk to us about partnership on a shoestring, how to foster sustainable research networks in Corona times and beyond. Stian. To be, be here. I have entitled my presentation, Partnership on a Shoestring, and let me start by what I mean with that in terms of academic operation. But, of course, partnership is also an implication and an expectation of having funding and institution with a low budget moving on working in that sense. And I take as my point of departure uh, the lab research laboratory that we have recently founded between Burkina Faso, Mali and Uppsala, Sweden. Uh, we call it Le Laboratoire d'Anthropologie Comparative Engagements. And by, to do this, we use, uh, either you can send out the papers, but often we use the, uh, some of the platforms within Uppsala University called Studium. So we create a, a space there, there. The reason why I'm bringing up this is because I think that when we are, and, and yeah, I should add, now we are planning that they have uh, uh, studying the barrier measures taken by the book in seeing that it was not going to take place. Uh, but we were wanted to look into insecurity in terms of military, in terms of citizens insecurity, violence, uh, political turmoil and so on. I think that a great impact of the corona situation will be that we will organize a, a roundtable on the corona pandemic in one way or another. So in that sense, I think it's, it's at two o'clock as I open my, the Mozambican uh, uh, contingent, they are chatting about what's going on at home and the news from the country and so on. And then at 14 minutes, 15, and 15 minutes past, which is the academic quarter in Uppsala, then we start. And then we also, so we, we try to encourage this kind of social interaction and, and, and so on. Uh, I must say, and I think this is maybe, maybe an answer to your question, I don't, uh, we don't res record the seminar part of the session because I, I don't think that we should uh, make Big Brother looking at us every time. But I mean, as lecturers, you can give the lecture, you can give the presentation, but the discussion, you have to feel free. You have to, I mean, it, you have to feel that you can be uh, less thought through in the seminar setting. Thank you. Yeah, I think that reminds me of that time we're going to have an online meeting for the conference. You mentioned that now was canceled. And for some reason, I think a technical issue, you didn't show up uh, on time. So some of us were there waiting for you and it was a lovely discussion. I, yeah. I, I, I don't think that this is a reason to, to recon sorry, so for reconsidering having uh, uh, physical meetings, of course. But, but I do think that we, we, we should think, uh, reflect also on our, our work. And for me, to give a kind of opinions carried out by university in the domain of e-learning to the first point e-national higher education program and e-learning public university in Cameroon. Uh, first of all, uh, let's say uh, this is the major policy reference of ICT development higher education, which is uh, called to respond to, to uh, seven axes. 
I, I can come back to it later if uh, it's necessary. And uh, this national uh, higher education, this national, this program has particularly contributed since 2016 to putting in putting pressure university <laughs> on designing uh, uh, that have to design and modernize their website the first thing and other virtual platform for more societal visibility inclusion and democratization of information as well as well as for more transparent administrative uh, practices i explain since the program has been put in place regional institution of higher education in sub-saharan africa and uh, the ministry itself. This, uh, the second point is also that it's a result laptops and online registration facilities. Regarding the free laptops, these are uh, uh, mobile computers that are offered to every registered uh, student at public, uh, public university in Cameroon. And uh, another point is that uh, I consider this as uh, an absolute opportunity to open up to for opening up to globalization and the burden of public university visibility. So the question that came into mind regarding the COVID-19 uh, pandemic were about three, but I will try to answer uh, to them uh, according to my own experience. Uh, the first is, does this apply to all public university and higher education program in Cameroon? How do Cameroon public university embrace e-learning and digitalization in the context of COVID-19 pandemic? And to what may be considered in the COVID-19 pandemic context as the new normal, how do public university in Cameroon to, uh, uh, adapt to digital technologies? So, to answer to those uh, preliminary questions and exploratory uh, research, we have attempted to, uh, to, to examine key points, one key point, actions carried out by public university administration as well as policy reference we mentioned earlier. And uh, uh, after our preliminary uh, um, inquiries, what we've realized is that there have been happy policy changes to so in, in, in a situation where there was like, okay, uh, not real uh, uh, engagement regarding the, 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 the digital technologies, there have been having ha happy policy changes, prompt adaptation, and, but also reluctance or absence. Happy development of public, mission, uh, of public measures. This has been observed through the, the diverse public meetings organized to try to find out solutions to the, to the context. There has also been design of e-learning platform within university website and for registered students. But while some of them are really functional from a direct internet access, others are not yet functional, but they are visible on the, on the university website, what is already quite good. The third point is the mobilization. Yes, the the third point is the mobilization of virtual platforms such as radio for teaching purpose in level four, level one, and two students, and intense use of WhatsApp group to share courses and other educa educative digital contents. Another point is the organization of video conference for e defense. However, in schools such as ERIC, the above initiatives are still limited to private master program, which uh, most of them are engaged in uh, international cooperation with other university partners. In this particular case, we also observe that while some lecturers and teachers seem already familiar to professional discussion with their students using digital platform, others seem in a total process of adaptation. Some categories go used to the utilization of digital technology to share professional contents of all kinds, find it difficult to adapt themselves to digital approach to teaching and group interaction within a fixed hour period. But what has been surprising is definitely the capacity of all the categories to comply with the situation and overcome personal and societal challenge. Regarding the absence, uh, has uh, result. In line with the absence, we have noticed that other public programs offered by the school uh, here in Eric have been totally interrupted. Planning a resume only in June 1st, 2020 has announced by the government. 
Regarding the strengths and challenges, the last point, in public universities such as the University of Yaoundé 2, students from level three to five are happy with the initiative for the low cost in terms of access constraint. I'll come back to it, uh, maybe through question constraint and online availability of completed courses program. For my own online experience teaching, uh, online experience using WhatsApp group in a specific program, I found it the process more demanding. Any written material should be very precise. Imagination works much more. I had to learn to use my phone devices, get to platform on time, and keep students alert for at least four hours. So, but beyond this, we have noticed problem of access, some lecture electronics to digital technology, and the inability to share written courses within the interval 20 hours. So uh, maybe I can come back, come back to, to way forward later. And, but I think uh, COVID, this new pandemic has been a great opportunity to explore free online platform, digitalize, think about digitalizing library contents and acquire learn and, um, and try to learn to use library and, uh, regarding the time constraint. I think I can hand here and come back to discussion later. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mireille. I think it's uh, great work that you've been able to start your research on, on actually how the COVID crisis is um, affecting um, the implementation of plans already there. Uh, very positive that they have been uh, fast forwarded. But you mentioned also problems of access, especially for your students. We, we spoke before today and you, you're running an entire course on WhatsApp. Uh, are all your students able to join that course, for instance? What are some of yeah. them uh, on, on problems yeah. of access? And then Mike yeah. has a question as well. Yeah. Yes, um, I can say if uh, uh, WhatsApp was the solution in that particular case, because this was the, 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 the cheaper, the cheaper uh, uh, digital technologies available to students, and uh, has, um, has a virtual platform, it was also the, the, the best alternative for the students. And according to the experience I had, um, uh, the problem of access, what is interesting here is that the problem of access is not only, was not only linked to internet, it was also linked to energy provide, provide, provide provision, electricity has there have been uh, many shortage, cuts of light, cutting light, uh, uh, things like that, that have been preventing, uh, that have prevented some students to, to be present at times and um, attend the course normally. Me, even me, I've been victim of uh, that uh, electricity shortage. So I think what is interesting here is maybe regarding the digital uh, technologies, it's, it's close relationship with the use of energy, electricity, energy, which is also a challenge here in Africa, in, uh, in Cameroon, in a particular environment. That's why I, I, I really focus on the problem of access, and I think this can be the contribution to the, to the debate in terms about linking the, the, the both. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Michael had a question. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Okay, uh, um, thank you so much for this um, wonderful presentation. Um, I, when, you, when I was going through your slide, I was happy to note that um, since 2016, Cameroon has been, this is done enough, like enough to digitalize level three to, three to four, they make use of radio. One to two, Consider yes. Considering the fact that radio uh, broadcast is limited to the view of only the presenter, do you think like is uh, a very a good means of um, lecturing the students? So this is my, these are my questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, J. Michael, for your questions. And regarding the experience from universities, access to transcript uh, via online digital platform, and it, 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 it all depends. As I said, it all depends. There are some universities that have been able to adapt of services already available online. For example, we can, uh, I can mention the University of Buea, the University of, uh, yes, the University of Buea and the University of Douala, 
uh, whom I was I, I could realize yesterday running the website that they are really advanced. And from the university in the University of Boya, for example, you don't need to to move to the university to apply for a transcript. So this is this all depends. That may seem more equipped is during the COVID pandemic context that they have been able to adapt their platform, but they did it so quick. Uh, platform uh, teaching or online teaching, the University of Marwa has been able <laughs> to adapt quicker than Eric. That seemed more funded and more equipped than the University of Marwa. So I think it's uh, all depend, and there is a question of leadership also. I think uh, regarding the um, uh, the process of adaptation here. Yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, the the question of the university and why uh, radio course. The first of all, uh, look at the looking at uh, taking a look at the uh, uh, um, of the at the I don't know how you call it, effective numbers of students. There are thousands at university. Uh, this is a point I I needed to mention. There are thousands, almost two thousand, two thousand and five, eleven, one and two. So it was difficult, according to exchanges I had with the uh, administrative uh, staff, is that it's difficult to interact in uh, using a platform to interact with 2,000 students at once, managing questions uh, on, on virtual platforms. So they just prefer a presenter, a, a lecturer to present the course and maybe uh, uh, get uh, two or three questions from the public intervening uh, directly uh, through the radio. And uh, regarding also the case of uh, WhatsApp groups, we observe that these are the kind of platform used only in small programs, 45 students, where it's more easier, though it takes like four hours, it's more easier uh, for, for one side or the other side, lecturers and students, to interact and have more close uh, discussions. So it it all depends, and I think, um, I think that from that particular point of view, there is a question of leadership, who is to the technologies uh, themselves. It's very very important. Thank you very much, uh, Mireille, and also for for uh, shedding light on what is happening right right now. That's very current research. We. Get to take part of there. At this point, I wanted to hand over to uh, Ms. Ndomo Lamini of the Association of African Universities. Uh, Ndomo, I think you have your um, video off, if it's possible to turn it on so yes. we can see you. Yes, there you are. Uh, so Ndomo, she is the Director of ICT Services and Knowledge Management at the AAU and therefore has a very particular vantage point to speak both from uh, from her organizational uh, experience, but maybe also on behalf of her members. The fact that there are diverse groups of uh, students and uh, people that need to be taken into consideration. And the biggest challenge, as has been said, is the broad infrastructure issues that really lead to uh, uh, challenges with equity and access. Um, and when we look at uh, some of these broad infrastructure, we need to remember that um, we must look at them at a campus level. If the campus infrastructure is weak, then that campus infrastructure cannot support uh, students and faculty remotely. And also there's national... to reach the rural areas during COVID-19 challenges. Could you turn off your video to make the sound more stable? Okay, Thanks. let me let me do that. Mm, let me do that. Sorry about that. No problem. Yeah. Let me stop my share. Okay. Uh, thank you. And now you can share the PowerPoint again. 
Yes, yeah. You can see it. We looked at at a campus level, at a national level, and also regional infrastructure level, and these uh, feed into each other. At a national level, we need our governments to be really looking at not just the urban areas in, 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 in terms of connectivity. For universities in Africa, we have what is called national research and education networks. Uh, the challenge is that they are not at the same level in, in terms of maturity. But uh, these institutions are the ones that are supposed to act as internet providers for educational and research institutions. So what we've seen during COVID-19 is that there have been negotiations that universities have been making with telecommunications companies to be able to address issues of connectivity for their students. Uh, the presentation on partnerships on a shoot string was very good, especially in relation to that funding has been prioritized to address uh, uh, health and other more urgent needs. And it seems like uh, education issues will not be priority for some time uh, until we fixed this uh, COVID. So as the Association of African Universities, we have focused our partnership strategy on advocacy and facilitation and providing expert advice to universities and helping them to verify providers, negotiating on their behalf, uh, speaking to some of the suppliers for consortium deals, that the universities could access. And we've also been doing a lot of capacity building through uh, webinars. Um, we are also learning that uh, mother is the necessity of innovations. I think for a long time, we've been trying to push universities to progress the digitization of their teaching, learning and research. And we thought uh, they were not moving fast enough. We also thought maybe it's a leadership issue. We needed more charismatic leaders to be able to move this agenda. But COVID has taught us that uh, when there's a need, uh, people or institutions are likely to listen. But we are seeing our universities in that universities are using, as the last presenter said, they are using email, they are using WhatsApp, they are using Google Classrooms, they are using Zoom. And uh, in terms of content, even though there's content out there from edX, Coursera and the like, uh, our universities are not yet using that, so we are trying to find a way to get them to look at that content and select what could be useful for them. But we know, of course, that academics sometimes resist universities uh, involved. Most of them are delegating their staff to participate in national uh, initiatives issue. Institutionalization of online education uh, is important. Even when COVID goes, we need to have a blended approaches to teaching and learning. We think our investors should consider sharing infrastructure on the cloud in order to reduce costs so that they don't all do their own small things. Training, training, I think is very important and our curricula has been challenged. It must be skills focused. The way that we examine must be different. We must have different ways of uh, assessing whether learning has happened. And then offline learning solutions are also becoming very important. Radio, TV, podcasts, sending materials to students. Uh, thank you so much, Nudumu, for kind of summarizing this um, conversation.
Uh, I don't see that anyone has a direct question to you. Uh, maybe your role was more of a discussion. Uh, and I think we'll come back to some of these issues in our discussion um, a bit later. Now we're going to move to break and we'll return 10 past the hour. Then it's 12.10. Um, and I'll stay on here 